Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us in CAPE today. Uh, my name is Rianne Moore, and I am the Administrative Coordinator of CAPE. And it is my honor to be introducing the Joyful Japanese American Stories Roundtable. Uh, first things first, CAPE is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are actually once again participating in Give and Make, which is a national campaign by Mighty Cause to support organizations that serve the API community during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Funds raised uh, through this program will support existing programs at CAPE, like the New Writers Fellowship, our CAPE Leaders Fellowship, uh, virtual programs like this, and even more. Um, in addition, up to $20,000 in cash prizes will be awarded to the organization with the most dollars raised or with the most unique donors. So really every single dollar and donation counts. And not only do we need your support, but we would love your help to spread the word. If you are able to, uh, please tell your friends and family why you, are, why you believe in our work and encourage them to support us too. That would be amazing. And if you are able to make a donation, please head over to giveinbay.org slash Kate USA. And so now onto the really good stuff. Uh, this joyful Japanese American stories panel is one way that we are celebrating the release of Sarah Kuhn's latest novel from Little Tokyo with Love, which just came out two days ago and is already the number one new release in teen and young adult Asian American fiction ebooks on Amazon. Sarah Kuhn is the author of the very popular heroine complex novels, a series that stars Asian American superheroes. Uh, she was also a finalist for both the Cape New Writers Award and the Astounding Award for Best New Writer. Sarah's YA novel was the Japan set romantic comedy, I Love You So Mochi, and she has also penned a variety of short fiction and comics, including the critically acclaimed graphic novel, Shadow of the Batgirl for DC Comics. So thank you so much for joining us during your release, Sarah. I'm also excited to introduce the rest of our fabulously talented roundtable, who have all who all play many roles and have such prolific bios. Uh, first up is Tamlin Tomina. Tamlin was born in Okinawa, Japan, and raised in California. Her first foray into entertainment came when she was crowned the LA Nisai Week uh, Queen at age 18. And her new title came with a trip to Hawaii where she auditioned for and won her first film role as Kumiko in The Karate Kid Part Two. Since then, she has memorably, memorably played Waverly in The Joy Luck Club and appeared in the drama film Come See the Paradise, a segment of the room and the disaster film The Day After Tomorrow. She has also very recently reprised the role of Kumiko this year for the streaming web series Cobra Kai. Kiko Ajina is a currently a, a series regular on the Fox new uh, Fox show Prodigal Son, where she plays Dr. Edrisa Tanaka. Prior to Prodigal Son, she was best known for the TV show Gilmore Girls, where she played Lane Kim for seven years and reprised the role in Netflix's Gilmore Girls seasons. In between, Ajina has been a series regular on Hulu's The First and rec recurring on Better Call Saul, Dirty John, and 13 Reasons Why. Kiko has also published an artist workbook titled No Mistakes through Penguin slash Random House, which is available wherever books are sold. And lastly, Maya and Alex Shibutani are two-time Olympic bronze medalists, three-time world medalists, four continents champions, and two-time US national champions. At the 2018 Winter Olympics, they became the first ice dancers of Asian descent to win medals at the Olympics and are the only are only the second sibling duo in the history of the sport to tip medal in ice dance. Off the ice, Maya and Alex are actually authors as well as active ambassadors and supporters for various organizations. Their first book, uh, Kudo Kids, The Mystery of the Mass Medalist was released in September, 2020. And their second book of their series for young readers, Kudo Kids, The Mystery in Manhattan just came out last week. So be sure to pick up your copy of that as well. And so thank you so much to this group for joining us. Uh, we will have a Q&A section at the end. So actually be, uh, feel free to drop questions in the comments on whatever live video that you're watching. And without further ado, Sarah, please take it away. Yeah, please do. Yes, Sarah, uh, let's get started. 
Uh, oh, she's she's not here. Uh, uh, no. I said, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump Sarah's in. Sarah's disappeared on us. I know. Uh, Sarah, Sarah's sound just um just cut out. But Rian, thank you so very much for for introducing us all. But I just need to because again, these are things that we need to correct in terms of conversation. So our very good friend uh, Keiko Agena is is pronounced. Yeah. Keiko Agena. And, you know, because we, you know, being, being all Americans and we are seeing, you know, 150 different cultures and ethnicities, it's like, how do we pronounce that name? K E K K E I K O A G A, you know, A G E N A. So uh, her name is the Japanese derivative of Keiko, and her last name is actually Okinawan. So Agena is her last name. So I just want to put that out there. So you know, again, there's yeah, there's no shaming, and it's it's just like I just need my name corrected. Uh, I just need my name correctly pronounced. So thank you, thank you so very much for bearing with us. You know, it's funny. Yeah. Like up until a year ago, I just wouldn't correct people. I don't know about other people, uh, other people on this panel, but I would just let them. I would just. But but see, this is the t I've always I've always like it's tomita. It's not tomita or tomato because you know from little school kids, it's like okay. no it's tomita. It's tomita. I think that again, an example because we try to not rock the boat is our is our is our forefather. Uh, no no, don't worry about it, Rian. Thank you, it's George Takei. George Takei's name is pronounced so commonly. Everybody says Takai Takai until he came up with. It's okay to be take. And everybody goes, oh, that's the mnemonic that I have to remember. That's how you pronounce it. So again, it's it's just a time to be, you know, to to be able to say, this is how my name's pronounced. Just practice it and we'll be cool. So that's all. So yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex. Yes. Uh, not Maya's brother. Yes. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a common pronunciation error you, that people get caught do need, up in. Do you need older brother? Uh, I, I, mean, you know, Alex, that could be helpful because sometimes people think we're twins. So maybe if you say yeah. older brother, then that'll clarify that fact. Right. It just I, I'm happy with Alex, uh, that guy or brother, you know, just it's nice to be able to be seen as, uh, as just an individual. Okay. I, I love writing my coaches, but yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Well, well. Thank, it's so good to see you guys. I think this is the first time I've been on a panel with both of you. Right, right. It is. Have you been on with Maya or or or, or Alex or brother Shibatani? Um. Yeah, Maya and I we we were talking about screen fatigue before this got started, uh, and Maya and I definitely right. definitely have that. But we're happy to be here with. With the one and only Sarah. There we go. She's she's your <laughs> sound is in. Yay! I think that's that was just a little uh, test I prepared for you all to see if you could, <laughs> you could handle okay. it without me. Um, no, that was really weird. It was like I, as soon as I was put on screen, everything went silent and it was just like frozen. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's um, that's wonderful. Okay. Um, we get it. You wanted a grand entrance. Yes, yeah, I wanted Very to dramatic. Do I wanted to make sure everyone saw me. It was sort of like, you know, um, a few years ago, or I guess this was actually probably many years ago, I went to see um, one of the opening nights of the musical of 9 to 5 when it was in L when they were doing like a test run in LA. And so like all the main ladies from the movie were there and they all sort of entered, but then there was a pause and then Dolly Parton entered last. And then during the show, the set broke and she got up and someone brought her a microphone and she was like, well, y'all, good thing I'm a big old show off. So I was really just trying to be like, I was trying to capture the magic of Dolly Parton. That's what, that's what that was all about. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, audience, for um, dealing with our, our technical difficulties, which I guess are just, just part of, you know, what, what virtual events are all about. Um, but I wanted to start off um, just again saying thank you all for being here. Um, I am going to captain this panel, or at least I was until I, I disappeared briefly. Um, and I'm going to try to guide our discussion a little bit. 
Um, so I wanted to start out talking about how, you know, we are all storytellers. We are various kinds of storytellers, which I think is really cool. We have kind of all told stories across the Asian American diaspora, as well as specifically Japanese and Japanese American characters. So I wanted to maybe start off talking a little bit about how over the course of these various careers, um, we have empowered ourselves to do that. And uh, for me, this was certainly uh, something that was a journey. It was not something I just, you know, decided one day I'm going to write all Asian books with all Asian protagonists who are fully rounded characters. And then it was done. That was not really something that was super obvious to me. So um, it was a process for me to get there. And I do want to talk about that. But first, I want to talk to all of you. So Tamlin, I was wondering if we could start with you, um, because you have obviously had such an incredible career. Um, I'm the oldest here. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, the no, you're yeah, you're a you, legend. You. You're a legend. Um, you were certainly one of the first Asian women I saw in a leading role in an American production. And I would say definitely the first Japanese woman I saw on screen in that context. And um, recently, I was very struck by this great interview you did with my friend Jen Yamato at the LA Times. Um, and you kind of talked about, um, very honestly, about how you came back to your Karate Kid role for Cobra Kai and how you wanted to bring sort of more authenticity to, authenticity to that this time, maybe bring a little bit more of yourself, a bit, a bit more of the culture. So I was wondering if you could talk about how you kind of got to that point where you felt that that was something you could, you could even bring up. Um, I, I think it, it comes with age, and 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 that's the that's a benefit of it is that you feel that you found your voice. I in, but what's what's in super incredible is that the young people of today are have found their voice already, and I think it's in alignment to the social justice, the racial inequity uh, movements that we're see, that we're finding is is totally in the zeitgeist or in the conversations. And young pr people are exercising their voice; they're exercising their opinion, and you l learning to listen, to listen attentively and with an open heart and an open mind. So with me, it you know starting out in mid '80s. It was a different time. It was a different time for you to say that I was the first Asian face or the first Japanese American face. It's like that's kind of rare. Where we're seeing we're seeing so many YA novels due to the brilliance of you and other writers, but also films and TV shows where we get to see more Asian and Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian faces, as well as Latinx, African American, LGBTQ, um, Indigenous peoples. Uh, that that's that's the benefit of of our age. So I just thought that when Cobra Kai. Came knocking on my door it's like uh thank you but i need to be a little bit more representative of what okinawa is because i did not have my voice back then in 1985 and they said are you kidding of course we shoot in atlanta there's not a whole lot of resources that we can get to concerning okinawan or you know authentic japanese culture and they said yeah so i took a chance there was nothing for me to lose and so it's just a collaborative spirit and uh, individual bravery and courage that each and every single one of us storytellers get the opportunity to make and take when we given the chance. That's amazing. Well, I think it's really cool that you did that. And I, I appreciated everything you said in that interview because I thought it was, again, so honest and just kind of talking about how that was a journey, you know, yeah. again, it wasn't something that maybe was apparent to you when you started out, but it was something that you had had maybe a chance to reflect on a little bit now. Absolutely. And it, it's, it's in different stages. There's, if I, if I took a look at the, the resume that I have, it's like, yeah, I talked to the costume designer about this choice and they said, yeah, but that's the way the director wanted to go or the producers wanted to go. And I go, Okay, it's too late, but at least I exercise my voice, especially when I'm playing a Japanese character and they put me in a in a Vietnamese I'll die because they wanted the flowing dress or something. So that's the kind of education that you know I, I'm not legislating or advocating that every single artist of Asian American Pacific Islander descent know everything about every single Asian American or Pacific Islander, but it's a continual education because you will probably more than likely be the one and only expert or the one because we 
have this face, we possess this face, that we're a little bit closer to the authentic picture of what it means to be that from that specific uh, Asian culture, uh, Asian or Pacific Islander culture. So that's that's kind of the responsibility, and you'll find it uh, being asked of during your career. I can probably guarantee that that's going to uh, every Asian American Pacific Islander artist is going to encounter. So be prepared. You can choose not to be, which is perfectly fine because we're all American. It's like, that's, that's what it is. It's like, I don't, you know, some folks don't have that connections, which is perfectly fine. A lot of Americans from different ethnicities don't. So we're not to judge. It's just that as artists, as storytellers, we might be asked to. So we need to kind of, uh, manage that kind of conversation. Um, and so Keiko, I kind of wanted to, to say then into you because um, you've also had a very long, amazing acting career, amazing creative career, and you played all of these really iconic characters, you know, on the stage, on the screen, just everywhere. Um, I feel like your characters to me feel so real, like they could just, you know, walk right up the screen and become my best friend. And, you know, I think, I think that for a while, I actually did think that like Lane Kim from Gilmore Girls girls was my best friend um and maybe you know now adrisa tanaka as well so my question for you is you know how are you so amazing um but seriously like how do you make that your characters feel so full how do you kind of work to bring those things to it because i think sometimes it's maybe not on the page at the beginning. It's it's maybe not apparent at the beginning. It's something you kind of have to, you know, kind of like along the lines of what Tamlin was talking about, just like bring your experience to it or some other pieces of you. So how do you kind of work to make those characters feel so full? Good question. I think um, um, I'm sort of experiencing it a little bit now because my heart is broken. Adrisa Tanaka, I don't know if everybody on this panel knows, but, um, we got canceled. So um, I know yeah. it's the worst news ever. But because of that, um, in the last couple of days, I've been getting these um, auditions coming in. And the thing about a piece of writing um, that when you do the audition in the first place, at least for me, is that I, I have to like go through this falling in love period with it. Otherwise, there's for me at least, there's just zero chance in hell. So, so I think it's that part of opening them that character up so much, so that I'm interested enough and know enough about them to really like invest my my heart into them. I kind of fall in love with them, um, and so I think that when I the times that I get cast in something, that process has already happened. So regardless of whether the audience ever gets to see it or the producer, director, everybody gets a little shade of something, but I've already kind of filled out the whole world of who they are um, for myself. And I think I know them really well. Um, does that so mean I, you have like secrets about the characters that like maybe only only you know like like that you're you're bringing to it like you you have maybe you know something that you that the, even the writer or the director doesn't know but that is maybe like a like a Keiko thing. Yeah, I mean Tamlin's nodding, but I mean I don't know how other actors are, but I feel like at a low minimum it's eighty percent of of what the character is that I have a relationship with. It is unknown to everybody else, it's like, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the, it's the iceberg effect of like yeah. how I know her is different than everybody else. I think I, I think it's it's true for both the writer and and the actor that you possess a secret and you try throughout the course of that character's presentation to keep that secret because it breathes and lives in you and yeah. it always intrigues the audience. It's like. What's going on, really? So that's 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 our fun. That's our fun. I love it. Well, Keiko, I hope that someday you write like the the secret diaries of Adrisa Tanaka, where we learn like all of the secrets that that we as the audience were not privy to. That were like the cake, the Keiko again as secrets of Adrisa okay. Tanaka. I'm just gonna give you that idea. I think I think you know eventually you could run with it. Um, so speaking of books, you know Maya and Alex, um, there was something specific I wanted to ask you about the Kudo Kids, 
which is a series about um, these siblings named Micah and Andy. I, I don't know how you came up with that. Um, no, no idea how that connects. Um, but they are always solving these really fun mysteries. And in the latest one, they're solving a mystery in New York. We get to meet some members of their extended family. And I really love that um, you, you guys have this Japanese American family in these books that feel so warm because I think a lot of times there's kind of this stereotype that there's no warmth or sort of outward love in Asian families. Like I feel like that's just a stereotype that kind of exists. And um, it's another way that I think our stories get, get flattened a lot. So I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about how you work to make that family feel really full and real and authentic. Sure. So Alex, we can kind of share this answer considering that we've been working on the Kudo Kids series together. I think Sarah, you alluded to it. We took a lot of our own experiences as we were creating these stories. Mika and Andy's dynamic as a sibling duo is similar, not the same to ours as we've been on our adventures around the world, but it was definitely important for us to create a new story for the next generation with a different set of siblings. But then when we were crafting the family and thinking of that, You'll notice that in our books, there's travel, there's food, there's adventure. So all things that we care about, you'll notice there's a lot of food, actually. And so growing up, family meals, all of that was so important to us. And our parents just really always encouraged us to take care of each other and be each other's best friend. So I think that their natural warmth just kind of infused itself into our character's parents. Yeah, it's it's that... Um, we're, you know, we're striving for authenticity in telling any story in any format. And for us, kind of delving into our own sort of personal experiences as being siblings, uh, I think the, the stage or the precedent was set by our surroundings. And so because we have this warm, caring relationship, uh, the supportive friendship that we, that we have, uh, it only seemed natural that Mika and Andy, although they aren't us, shared a lot of the same qualities and characteristics that it would be informed by their own surroundings. And so, um, you know, you're talking about kind of the things that you share for yourself and the things that people pick up and perceive. And so I'm so glad that that is something that people are connecting to and, and realizing and in, in enjoying the story and these characters. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely been one of the aims. And obviously in the creative process, you have to be process oriented. And so uh, a lot of the things that your audience, your readers, may pick up on, uh, they might not completely understand the foundations of what you've built, uh, but it is sort of a intangible, an intangible feeling that they get. It's the emotion that they're able to draw from the story, what, what connects them to you know, your characters. And so uh, I think, you know, whether it's acting in television or film or, or writing books uh, like Sarah does, it's that strength of bond between viewer, reader, and characters uh, that keeps people coming back for more. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. And I, I think that what I love about all of these answers is that um, it, it has a common theme of sort of being brave enough, being vulnerable enough to sort of bring that little bit of yourself you know, to the work, which can be very hard sometimes, um, especially if this is not something you you see every day, right? So, you know, that was sort of like what I was thinking about with with talking about, you know, the journey, how did you get there, all this stuff, because, you know, when I wrote these questions that I had to think of, like, answers for myself, too, which, um, you know, I don't always like doing, but um, I think what I was thinking about was just, you know, um, when I started writing, when I started writing fiction in particular, um, it really never occurred to me that I could write uh, the sort of joyful, you know, fun stories that I enjoyed growing up that were the things that I wanted to write, you know, things like superheroes and fantasy and romantic comedies and like all of that good stuff. I loved it all. It was so joyful. And um, like I'm guessing uh, maybe everyone here, I felt like I certainly did not see myself centered in those stories. You know, I, I did not feel like I saw tons of, in especially Asian American women, just having like the best time, you know, living their best life in these stories. I, I felt like 
if we were present, it was usually kind of sad. It, it was usually like kind of a lesson. It, it was, you know, it, it had to be sort of this quote unquote um, uh, important story, right? Um, and so I, I know that when I started writing fiction seriously, you know, I had I had started writing this story that became sort of my first little fiction thing that that broke out. It was a novella called One Con Glory. It's a serialized story about a nerd girl, the comic book convention. It's a little rom-com, a little bit about an action figure quest. And this character, um, you know, she was a journalist. Her job was covering comic cons. That was kind of my job for a while. And so I had made her so much like me. And then I had the thought of like, well, should, should she be just like me? Should she be like biracial, Japanese American, you know, third generation, like all of these things. And I rejected that idea so fast that I'm I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about it now. You know, it was that sort of self-rejection. It was that like, I can't do that because this story is supposed to be fun. It is supposed to be romantic. It's supposed to be joyful. And I have never really seen anyone like myself centered in that kind of story. So it just felt like, not even something that was in, you know, that I could conceive of being real, that I could conceive of being a story. And um, I have told this story a lot, but um, the reason I actually started writing Asian American protag protagonists centered in these stories uh, was because after uh, One Con Glory came out and it kind of got a little bit of a following, especially among geek girls, a lot of people just thought the character was Asian because she was so much like me. Like it was, they were like, oh, well, yeah, she's really grouchy and she likes to argue with everyone about the X-Men and like, this just feels like you, Sarah. So we think this character is Asian. So it was like kind of this assumption, right? And so then when I started writing um, what would become my debut novel, Heroin Complex, which was about, you know, this is, this is the series. So you can see like, it's very like wacky and, and colorful and you know, they're, they're superheroes fighting ridiculous things. And I had another split second decision where I was like, well, I might as well make this character Asian because everyone's gonna think that anyway. <laughs> and I feel like I wish that was like a more like brave story, but it was really just like, why not? Why not? Um, and I, I think that it was really later, like while I was writing it, while I was writing this sort of joy and, you know, this fun and all of these antics <laughs> that I started feeling like this actually feels important. This feels like something I haven't seen before. This feels like something I can really um, feel feel kind of empowered by. And, you know, so in, in Little Tokyo, in From Little Tokyo with Love, which is the new book, I have to remember to hold it up because I always forget that on these panels. But um, I actually did it did a little bit of something meta where it was like this. It's about this girl who doesn't believe in happy endings. She doesn't believe in fairy tales. She doesn't believe she can have a happily ever after. And a lot of it was because she's never seen it. She's never seen a biracial like Japanese American girl get like a fairy tale happy ending where she gets to wear the big dress and like kiss people and stuff. So um, I think like I felt like that was a little bit of a, a full circle. But again, I, I felt like that was really like a journey. And so um, I loved hearing about how it was all kind of a journey for you all too. And it sort of took, you know, different turn, different twists and turns. Um, and since, you know, we are here to talk about joy and this is called Joyful Japanese American Stories, you know, I do think that um, writing joy for marginalized characters to me feels very revolutionary. It feels like something that is very powerful and those are stories I love consuming. So I wanted to focus a little bit on that joy, just hold on it for a minute. And I thought we could talk a little bit about how we as creators sort of find that joy, cultivate it, protect it as Asian American artists, because sometimes honestly, I feel like that is one of the hardest things. So I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about how like you find that and protect it and just keep it, keep it inside or outside. I don't know, whatever, whatever your journey is. <laughs> and whoever wants to start can start or I can call on someone. I know no one wants to go first on a Zoom panel because they're scared they're gonna interrupt each other. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I'll be I'll be quick too because I know that I'm sure everyone has a lot to say on this. But uh, I think the word journey, Sarah, that you mentioned is 
uh, really critical to all of this because we're all coming from different places. We're all on our own timelines. And so how you sort of find what kind of makes you go as a creative, as a creator is, is different in individual and we are all individuals and have our own perspectives. Uh, and in a way we are conditioned to, you know, as creators um, in talking about sharing stories, creating stories, whether they are referencing our own experiences or not, we're conditioned to kind of look to our audience or what is out there um, in, from a business perspective, like, oh, are there other books that are like this? Because that somehow points to what people want to read. Or are there, um, you know, from a competitive perspective like skating, oh, is this what is deemed to be good, right? Uh, you know, we want good placements. And so shouldn't we be following a roadmap? And it, the, the, the honest answer is that everyone has their own roadmap. Uh, there is no one path to success and the path is never a straight, you know, linear line in one direction. And so just being open to the ebbs and flows of, of creativity and being patient, <laughs> which, which, which is a part of the process. I think we all understand that, but can be difficult to sort of deal with and handle in the moment. But uh, it's that sort of torturous and joyous uh, kind of coexistence. Yes, you just described writing very well. It's joyous and torturous in, in equal measure. Um, but I, I really like what you said about sort of like having a, you know, how everyone's kind of on a, a different timeline. And, you know, we all are kind of in this together, you know, on, on these journeys together. Um, Maya, what about you? How does How do you kind of find and protect that joy? I think Alex kind of got it off to a good start when you speak about audience. I think sometimes it can be challenging if you feel pressure coming from the audience, but I think for us, especially with creating the Kudo Kids series, we were thinking about all the young readers that we wanted to share these stories with. And so when Alex and I would work on scenes and try and make it as funny as possible or as exciting as possible, thinking of the little kids being able to read their books and go away on this adventure and kind of escape from the world around them for an hour or two just meant so much to us. And so that was very motivating. And then also, especially after our first book came out, to hear the feedback that parents were reading with their kids, that's so special because I remember reading with my mom and dad. And so to picture that environment where these family memories are being created, that's what keeps me going when sometimes it's a little bit more challenging than not to work with Alex via Zoom. <laughs> um, yes, and I think you, you both brought up something interesting about audience, you know, sort of like thinking about the audience, thinking about the reactions and things like that, because I think one thing that it's important to sort of put out there for especially younger creators, younger Asian American creators, younger creators who are mar marginalized in any way, is that there are also these things that are just like thought of as conventional wisdom or accepted wisdom or whatever it is. You know, when I when I was first started when I first started writing Heroin Complex and some of my other books, um, I remember people would say things to me and people who, by the way, didn't even work in publishing, but they just thought this is how it is. So they would say things like, you know, oh, this is going to be a, a hard sell. This is very niche. And I was like, it's superheroes. What about oh? I see, <laughs> I see what that's code for. It means that they're not white. They're not white characters. And it was, I got all of the, you know, oh, they, they will let you have one Asian character, but you can't have two, you can't have more than one. They won't put them on the cover. They won't put their faces on the cover. They, you know, they won't do all of those, these things. They will make you change X, Y, and Z. And by the way, none of that happened. That was not, you know, that was not actually how it was. This cover has three Asian American women on it. You know, it has their faces. And, you know, nobody asked me to, to change that. Um, I, you know, and I, I feel like I certainly got very lucky. I was very happy to have that that first publishing experience. But I also think that that, that can be very damaging for younger creators to hear like, this is how it is, when actually that audience is out there, you know, that audience is all of us. Um, Keiko, do you want to talk a little bit about how you maybe find and protect your joy? Sure. I was just talking about this to a friend of mine the other day where I've actually been kind of on a years long journey to find joy, which to me is also gratitude. So, uh, and this is not new news, but you know, when you, when I was younger, I almost, um, would wear like, like victimhood and bravery and protection 
was all sort of one thing and it, and it made me feel strong to, and it, there's a kind of defensiveness almost that um, can be part of that. And to get to the point where I had to let go of that is a very vulnerable process and it was hard, but the replacement to that anxiety and victim defensiveness is gratitude. And so for anybody that wants like actual practice, or, or if, if you would like a practical things, like it sounds stupid, but you know, I do yoga. I do cause I don't find it easy to do this. So I do yoga. I write my morning pages I meditate and I have, I keep a little book so that I, I will, uh, if I check mark everything for that one day, I my gift is that, oh, I'm drinking water, is that I get to highlight it at the end of the day. And sometimes that's the only thing that will get me to actually do those little things. Um, but uh, I feel better than I did 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Water, water and highlighters are important. Water and highlighters, yes. Please remember those are important things to stack up on. What about you, Tam? It's it's I'm just gonna jump on 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 on, on Keiko's gratitude because it is this is about gratitude and feeling the 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 fullness of the blessings and uh the privilege that we all get to live here in in Los Angeles and get to experience little Tokyo within 10, 15 minutes. It's like I could see, you know, downtown from here. It's, 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 it's that joy of, of community. It's that joy of the chance to see somebody that are, is going to be walking down the street, but also because I have this face, I'm in little Tokyo. There is a chance that people will go, Hey, do you know where, you know, Fugetsudo is, and I go, yes, it's right down the street. And, you know, you could get the mochi right now or the sakura mochi, which is, again, that's a whole other thing that I'm not going to go to. But it, it's about the joy, about knowing how much Little Tokyo has been a part of my life. And I get to be uh, an ambassador uh, for the true Nisei week, not the Nikkei week, as is in from Little Tokyo with love. But it's also about the gratitude in knowing that I don't know everything about Little Tokyo because there are persons that are not of Japanese descent that claim Little Tokyo as their hub. Um, persons like Jenny Yang or Taz, you know, Osmed. It's like those, those, per, you know, as as well as it, there, there's there's folks that Keiko and and Tracy Kato Kiriyama know and Sean Miura know, trying to revitalize and bring in all Los Angelinos and really realistically the world into Little Tokyo and knowing what it means to be of Japanese or Japanese American descent because those are two different cultures. Those are two different kinds of ways of thinking, which can be in battle sometimes because sometimes they get, you know, at at at, at the Nisei Week Parade, they go, oh, you know, sumasen, man, you're wearing your yukata hantai. You're wearing your yukata, the collar is opposite. And I go, oh my gosh, that's right. You know, so it's those little things that we, who are lucky enough to claim our Japanese-ishness is to say, ah, that's right. That's when I'm really truly American because I forgot that it's supposed to be this way. So it's it's those little kinds of those little kinds of jewels and that appreciation of what it means to be in this melting pot of Los Angeles, but specifically in Little Tokyo and Japanese America, to be, you know, to be grateful, thankful for consistently, con persistently learning about what it means to be American, Japanese and Japanese American. Sometimes they can all coalesce, sometimes they're at odds with each other, but that's the fun part because there's no one correct way. And that's what makes us as individuals unique and as our culture so malleable and so welcoming because I I, I, ha I carry great pride in being Japanese American and, and the traits that people assign Japanese American culture and I'll go, yeah, I take that, even though it may be stereotypical. It's like, nah, I'll take it because they're great qualities. They're great human human qualities. And I, I think I can assign that to many cultures across our nation. Yes, I love that. Um, and I love that you brought up community in Little Tokyo because that was actually kind of um, 
my answer to this, I guess, is I, I feel like increasingly um, I do find that joy and I am able to protect it because of community, because of people, you know, and you name so many of my faves, um, Jenny and Taz and Sean and all those people. Um, you know, I think um, I actually, so I grew up, you know, in a very small, very white rural town. I was one of the only faces that was not a white person. I was basically me and my mom and my brother. And then there was one other mixed Asian family in town and the, the daughter and I were best friends. Um, but, you know, I didn't feel like, except for through my mom, that I necessarily had that Japanese American community growing up. You know, I really only had it when we would go to Portland and there were, you know, the festivals every summer and I got to kind of spend time doing that. And it always gave me this very warm kind of feeling like I was, I was at home, even though I didn't, necessarily know anyone there except for my family. And, you know, so when I, I moved to LA and I found kind of this greater Asian American community and I really found that arts community because of Keiko and because of, of Jenny Yang, um, you know, I met them and they kind of invited me into that. They told me about things like, you know, Tuesday Night Cafe and uh, Jenny, of course, had the Comedy Comedy Festival and all of these great things that really brought that creative of Asian American community together. Um, and I remember, go, you you know, going to my first Nisei week, like experiencing all of that and just having that same feeling of being home, you mm. know, and you you mentioned that, you know, in, in From Little Tokyo with Love, I did change some things. I did change the festival. It is a fictionalized version of the community because I'm like, only the good parts are the parts that are true, I promise. Um, but um, I, I want, what I really wanted to capture was that, that beautiful feeling of being sort of interconnected of having this kind of almost greater extended family just mm -hmm. in that community you know and I love that sense of like when I go there I feel like I always run into someone I know like even right. next, I run into someone I know um I think the the my first Nisei week I, you know I went to the parade and I was watching you know everyone doing the dances and stuff and I was like that looks like uh that looks like Tamlin Tamita doing those doing those dances with them. That person really looks like Tamlin Tamita. And then someone, maybe Keiko was like, Sarah, that is Tamlin Tamita. <laughs> that is like, that, that's a little Tokyo style. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, but whenever I go there, I feel like I get that, that same feeling, that really beautiful family feeling. Um, so kind of like um, another thing I wanted to ask all of you is about community because I, I feel like, of course, right now it is a little weird we are physically separated in many ways we are coming together more often like this in a virtual way so and you know we are in community together on this panel I think that is very lovely and I was wondering if you could all talk about kind of how community has played a part in your work or your joy as an artist or just kind of what that means to you you know as a, a Japanese American person creating this art <laughs> Tamlin, you can go first. <laughs> okay, I'll, I I'll, off last time. Yeah, because thank you, thank you, because I did, I did bring it up. But the, it, it is because, and actually, I need to correct the introduction because um, I did win uh, Nisei Week Queen in 1984, and then I went back to school at UCLA, and then there was a call here in LA about Karate Kid to the audition. So I did not go to Hawaii and audition over there for Karate Kid too. I I, I don't know where that, but it's it's it, it's because it kind of blends in together. Um, but I I went to Hawaii as Nisei Week Queen in April of '85, and then the auditions for Karate Kid two took place in June of '85. So I just for my first time in Hawaii. It was it was April 1985. It was like oh my god, I love Hawaii. No wonder everybody in Hawaii is you know AAPIs are just you know just so cool and, and calm because they're the majority there. Shh. Um, right. So that that was the joy of that whole. And then uh, uh, I got Karate Kid too. So that was another thing. But. I wouldn't have got that audition if I hadn't run for Nisei Week because it was not only me because I was queen. It was a whole community of Japanese, Japanese American girls and Asian American girls who were open to this audition for the role of Kumiko and Karate Kid too. So that's that's the reason why. So 
And I never had any dreams or aspirations to be an actress because I wanted to be a history teacher. That's another kind of storyteller because to know our histories, you got to know the stories that took place before. So that was my connection is like, I think I could do this because I already love reading stories historically. So I think that's what is part of acting is that homework and that research. But in terms of community, I wouldn't be who I am without this community. So that's why I'm consistently cognizant of the fact that I have to give back because I ain't nobody without the people who made me, you know, feel welcome, feel at home. Every time I go to Little Tokyo, it's like, hey, it's nice to see. Every time I bring people to Little Tokyo, they say, oh, wow, this is a really special place. It's community. It feels like home. And and yeah, it's, it's that furosato, uh, which in Japanese means hometown. So no matter where you come from, you get that same kind of feeling. Because And it's not, it can be as simple as because we all kind of look alike. You know, we have Asian in API faces. But it's just there's I, I truly believe in that energy, in that spirituality of connectivity, of community and of neighborhood. So that's what I'm there to celebrate and uplift and consistently invest in. Love it. What about you, Keiko? You're nodding very vigorously. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. What can I add? Uh, so besides the in-person stuff, which I uh, always want to give a shout out to Tuesday nights at the cafe because that's such a place where my heart is. But lately, things like this, organizations like Cape and Gold House and uh, people that I follow on Twitter and the social media platforms have actually really touched me, especially um, uh, there are a lot of journalists that are Asian that write and I don't know if it's just in my feed, but in the last couple of years, I mean, man, they are coming out with some great stuff. And every time I see that pop up in my feed, it feeds me. And um, I I rely on I rely on this social media the post of Cape and Gold. I'll admit it of Gold House and and um, Dino. You know, just like supporting each other because sometimes I don't you know I don't see people in my community every day and that's sometimes all the way I am able to be fed so uh so that's my my deal and that was uh Dino Ray Ramos right yes he was amazing he is always a journalist he has an awesome podcast he's always trying to highlight I feel like, you know, API experience, like different strides we're making in the entertainment industry. He is just the most awesome. Um, but Maya, could you talk a little bit about how community might connect you? And it doesn't have to be Little Tokyo, you know, in Kudo Kids, I feel like you both kind of also described, again, this very, you know, sprawling, interesting Japanese American community that's very interconnected through this family. So could you talk a little bit about just how community kind of plays into your work? Sure, I feel like asking about community is kind of a similar question to asking where your hometown is. And since Alex and I grew up kind of all over the US for skating and our training, I think what you realize is that community is what you make of it. And so especially during the pandemic, having this digital forum where we can all be connected here right now, that to me is so special because for example, Sarah, we're Twitter friends originally. Like that's how this all came together. And it's just very special that now we're all in these little boxes together. And so I think that it's, amazing that through storytelling, you can not only share the community that you love, but also just introduce it to new people and hopefully invite them into your story so that you can build that understanding. Because I think that that's what we're all looking for, is that greater sense of understanding so that our community can keep growing. Because it's not just isolated to distinct silos. I think that you can combine it into the global community that we're all a part of too. How about you, Alex? Oh, is he frozen? Oh, there. <laughs> you're muted. Oh, you're muted. I'm muted. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> First it's been time. a year and a half, you'd think. <laughs> but I haven't figured out by now. Um, oh, I think he's frozen again. <laughs> anyway, it is. And Maya and I are becoming more and more. Oh, am I? Am, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. You were frozen for a minute. You must have been saying something okay. very much. Okay, good, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll if you can, 
Um, I guess my internet. Oh yeah. I guess my internet connection isn't that great. But um, <laughs> as far as our experience with Little Tokyo, we don't have childhood experience um, in that community. Uh, but it's been amazing to get get to know it better past year and a half, especially. And growing up on the East Coast and being the only Asian American kid in the majority of my schools that I went to, uh, I had to become pretty comfortable with and and being uh, uh, a male figure in all boys school in Connecticut and skating with my sister, pretty comfortable with myself um, in order to just deal with like you know typical kid stuff. And so one of the things that has really been such a blessing for Maya and me in our lives has been our ability to find and make friends go regardless of like, their cultural background or their interests. And that's an amazing thing about sports. We've been able to meet people from all over the world. And whether you're a figure skater or, or you swim, uh, we're able to kind of share in our passion for, for life, for our passions and our dreams. And so I think that's why it's been so much fun to be able to, to meet people on Twitter, I guess, during the pandemic and become connected through, through just interests. So it can feel kind of sterile and not the best when we're not able to meet in person, but I think it is that level of connection that is pushing things forward. And what was mentioned at the beginning of the call, I can't remember by who, but just um, things are different now generationally. It was a different time back then. But I think because of the platforms that are available to us uh, and the example that we're able to set for others and that we're able to be inspired by others as well, it moves things a little bit faster. There is a greater expectation for what we should be striving for, you know, that we don't have to wait anymore. We can tell our own stories. Our voices are important. We're the ones that um, have the ability to shape the future. Yes, it was awesome. And I agree. Um, There's also like one thing I'd like to just add on because again we're uh, and focusing on Little Tokyo and the global community. It's also recognizing the the our forebears, you know, the ones who really built the foundations for our community, specifically here in Little Tokyo and Los Angeles, but also the global communities and you know especially from the sports worlds where the shape sibs come from. It's 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 just recognizing again that 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 notion of gratitude that. We can look towards, you know, thanking the, the the new generations who are building forward, who are progressing forward with all of us together, but also to be mindful of looking back as to what our elders know and still know and still have to be kind of coddled into teaching us because they go, ah, the young kids don't know anything. But it's just because we kind of are are uh, excited and and energized to go forward, but we need to be we be be mindful about looking back as to the lessons they they've already known, experienced, suffered through, and lived through and triumphed with. So that's that's what I'd like to make sure that we all connect, you know, the present generation with the future young ones, as well as our old ones who who really have so much to give us and so much that we can be always thankful for. Yes, I love that. And, you know, I, I think it's so true. I mean, one thing I was kind of thinking about as you all were sharing all of these wonderful things is that um, another way that I, I really have, have just been so grateful to experience community is that I feel that um, we are all very supportive of each other. You know, I, I think that when my first book came out, you know, it's it's a scary time. You don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> also, I, I debuted in 2016, which does not sound like that long ago, but there were not as many Asian books. There were not as many Asian American authors there, you know, and the ones who were there, like talking about sort of the people who came before you, I remember just like, they didn't know me at all. And they welcomed me so warmly, you know, it was people like Naomi Hirahara, who's also a big like little Tokyo person um, and uh, Cindy Pond, Melinda Lowe, um, Courtney Milan, Ellen O, like all these authors who were already there and sort of understood what the challenges were, what it was like to be especially an Asian American woman who was <laughs> debuting. Um, and they didn't, I mean, they didn't know me at all. And they were just kind of like, whatever you need. I remember Naomi Hirahara would, like met me for cronuts, like in little Tokyo, like back when cronuts were a thing, she was like, come, come meet me and we'll have Cronuts and I will. Cronuts I will, are still a thing. I know. Again, like 2016, it doesn't sound that long ago, but um, but yeah, she. I, I felt like so 
welcomed by that, by by someone who who didn't even know me. And then, you know, I feel like I've seen it at all of our events, at like things that we've done. And of course, you know, Asian AF, which I've seen Keiko and Will Choi and so many other wonderful people do so many times. I feel like we all show up for each other. And that support is really beautiful. And that is something that has certainly kept me encouraged and kept me going on this sort of journey of being an Asian American artist. Um, so we have talked so much that we only have a few minutes left. And uh, before we go, I did want to mention also, I held up Kudo Kids, but I also wanted to hold up No Mistakes, which is Keiko's wonderful book. And I really recommend this to um, all of my creative friends, all of my artist friends, because it just, it's so loving, it's so gentle. It gives you all of these like wonderful exercises. And I think if you're going through like a creative slump or burnout or feeling like disconnect from the community since this has been such a weird year, this is something that I think has really saved me. And so now I offer it to you as something that can possibly save you as well. Um, so we have, uh, we got an audience question. So this actually might be a nice one to end on. Um, Suhiro Cafe in Little Tokyo, by the way, mentioned in two of my books, was just awarded a, an historic grant do you have any stories about your favorite little Tokyo restaurants or businesses? So I thought maybe since we only have a couple minutes, we could just go around and say like, I don't know, a recommendation or something you love in little Tokyo. It doesn't have to be a restaurant just, or it could be, you know, a, a site or just anything. Um, and since um, I get to go first, I can't say Suhiro because um, that is one of those places where it was, you know, where I went to eat and I felt it's a family owned restaurant. It's been in the neighborhood forever. I felt that very warm family feeling. I always feel very cradled when I'm there. Um, and uh, I loved it so much that I, I put it in a couple books. And I still remember one of my favorite uh, reviews I have gotten is uh, someone reviewed Suhiro on Yelp. And they said, I went here because I read about it in this book called I Love You So Mochi. And I was like, amazing. Can I put that on the dust jacket? Like, that's what I would really like is that I got someone to go to Suhiro because of my book. So um, maybe if we could all just say one thing that we love, something in Little Tokyo. Um, Keiko, do you want to start? Sure. I'm sorry. I have to say Siri Heroes too, only because there was a there was talk about maybe not going on with it. So this is news to me. I was kind of heartbroken because when before I really hung out in Little Tokyo that much, that place I would go to, and we would always go to like late, late, late at night because that was the only place that was open those days. So like little Keiko, like new to LA Keiko. That's what that place means That's, to me. Yeah, like, I, oh. I, I love that. I mean, I still remember one of my like proudest moments was I went there one late at night one time to have some after show meal or something. And one of the aunties who was, you know, taking my order and stuff, like I think I ordered a drink and she was like, Can I see your ID? And I showed it to her and she looked at the I she looked at my age and then she looked at my face and she went, Hmm, good job. <laughs> I just, I treasure that always. Again, better than any award I could get. Um, Tamlin, what about you? I, 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 of course, everybody's going to say Suihiro. So that's, and, and Kenji, you know, Suzuki family is going to be, you know, propped up. But there are two other restaurants that I always have to mention as well because they're the old school restaurants. So Mitsuru Cafe and Grill, which is directly across the street from Fugetsudo, which is the mochi restaurant, which is the mochi shop that everybody knows. But also, that, so those three businesses, Suihiro, Mitsuru, and Fugetsudo are all on First Street. But then I also get a shout out to Koraku Cafe on Second Street which is the other ramen gyoza shop that, you know, is old school, you know, they're not, you know, glamorous gourd, but they just have the home style cooked food that everybody craves after, you know, and, and can hang out late night. So that's, those are the three restaurants that I'd like to put out and say, if anybody gets a chance, put it up on your TikTok. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what about you? So actually, I don't think Maya and I have been to Suhiro. Oh. Uh, well, so we're looking forward to yeah. becoming <laughs> consistent patrons of, of that. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> this is um, but I think that, uh, you know, the Japanese American National Museum, uh, I don't know if they serve food there. They might. Um, but it, if they do, you know, wonderful restaurant filled with history. Um, 
And I think I think that's just it's incredible that that space is there. Uh, the new Terasaki Budokan uh, it hasn't officially opened yet, but I think that's going to be a really amazing and beautiful cultural space for Japanese Americans and the Little Tokyo community at large,、um, especially for young people. But I think one thing that Sarah said. That oh no, Alex, your internet. Really struck me. I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> yeah, you're freezing. What did Sarah say? <laughs> oh, okay. So if I'm back,、um, back. the the Yelp review story、uh, was was so beautiful because it is through our stories that we can immortalize the things that we love and that we hold closest to our heart. Because you told that story, you were able to share something that was special with you that will live on through. And through the experiences of your readers, and so that kind of struck me as being、um, incredibly important, and why we all do what we do. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I I would love it if I got like a mil, you know, there were just a million Yelp reviews that were like, I went to Suhiro because I read about it in Sarah's <laughs> book, or I watched this panel maybe.、Uh, Maya, what about you? I feel like everyone's already said all the amazing spots, but I think Sarah, you have a restaurant that you have yet to open. I don't know if this is breaking <laughs> news, but I feel like. From your book, there's a restaurant down the line coming from Sarah. Everyone, so that's stay tuned.、Right. That's right. But I thought you guys agreed to collab with me on that, so <laughs> it will have to be like a group effort. I'm in Little Tokyo with Love. There is a restaurant I invented called Katsu That, and it is owned by、uh, the the sort of parental figures in the book. These two aunties、um, who are actually both. Ex、uh, Nikkei Nisei Week queens.、Um, they were, you know, pageant beauties, and now they are a married couple. And so they, you know, like continue living in Little Tokyo. They opened up a restaurant called Katsu That, and their claim to fame is that they will katsu anything. You can get anything as katsu at that restaurant, and that is definitely going to be,、um, you know, my my next career move is to open up that that restaurant with this panel. I think it's going to be a big hit,、um, but. We are actually out of time. I wanted to thank everyone for being here, both in the audience and on the panel, and our wonderful friends at Cape. They are all so cool.、Um, and we also wanted to mention that、uh, my home bookstore, The Rip Bodice, they are amazing. They are offering a 15% discount code for all online orders, not just of my book, but of any book. So you can order Kudo Kids, you can order、uh, No Mistakes, you can order whatever you want. You can order lots of cool romance novels. And the code is just with love. It is the last two words of the title. Pretty easy to remember. It's good through, I believe, Friday at midnight. So. Get all your orders in. Order wonderful books. You can order signed books for me,、um, and it'll all be great.、Um, and I think now we can welcome back our friends from Cape. Hello, yes, Hamlin Keiko, and thank you so much for your grace in that pre-event faux pas of mine. But and Maya, Alex, and of course Sarah, thank you so much for such an enlightening and vibrant discussion. The support that you have for each, that you give to each other, and that you have for each other is so strong, and it really shone through.、Um, so great discussion.、Um, yes, Sarah's book from Little Tokyo with Love is out now. Be sure to grab a copy. As a YA fan myself, I got the chance to devour it last month, and I have a signed copy thanks to、uh, Sarah's Instagram. I have a signed copy waiting for me at my Chevaliers because I knew I, the moment I heard about that, I was like, yes, gotta reserve it there.、Um, yes, and. As mentioned,、uh, use the code with love to get fifteen percent off your online order at the romantic store, the store、uh, bookstore, the Ripped Bodice,、um, and get all, all of these books.、Um, we have such amazing authors here.、Um, be sure to follow Cape on Instagram at Twitter at Cape USA. And to the five of you again, thank you so much for joining us. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Cape. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone.